Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us as we are waiting for everyone to sort of be let in out of the waiting room. I just wanted to mention that this uh, week's sponsors are Hunt Utilities and Happy Dancing Turtle. And I also wanted to thank our team of producers who help cover the costs of digital production and all of these activities around our concerts transcending the night. We have executive producers Rich and Marit Reese, James Harbo, and Roger and Don Bobian, and associate producers Dr. Arthur and Joanne Weaver. Also, all Lakes Area Music Festival activities are made possible by the voters of Minnesota through grants from the Minnesota State Arts Board and the Five Wings Arts Council, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. As you're all uh, meandering in today, I would draw your attention to the question and answer, the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. Feel free at any point to put a question in there for me or our guest, and we will get to it probably at the end, but it's great if you can go ahead and put those in whenever the question occurs to you. So then we have a nice sort of roster of questions built up to ask our guest. Um, also, I would draw your attention to the chat function, another button down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I would invite you to open that up and say hello uh, and say where you're tuning in from. We always like to see who and uh, where we are reaching. One other thing in there is to make sure at the bottom of the chat bar, uh, you see an option that should say all panelists to all panelists. If you could change that to all panelists and attendees, that way everybody will be able to see your chats. So now it's my pleasure to welcome our guest today. Uh, I have known Paul Hopper for almost half of my life at this point. We first met as students together at the Eastman School of Music. And he was at the first year of the Lakes Area Music Festival back in 2009. He has had a fascinating career in all sorts of facets of opera, and he is certainly one of the voices of the future of opera. And he's one of our new artistic advisors and the curator of our upcoming concert this coming Saturday at seven o'clock central time, transcending the night. So please welcome Paul. Good morning, Taylor, and good morning to the LAMF family, it's good to see you, Taylor, in person and to see everybody digitally across this platform. I'm very happy to be here to join you for today and uh, in preparation for next week's concert also. Yeah, we're so happy to have you here and to have you on board again with the organization and really looking forward to this weekend's concert. I wanted to start uh, by just going a little deeper into the bio that I mentioned in your introduction, you've you've done so much in this field, so many different things. Tell me, tell me how you started and sort of what that progression has been for you. Sure. Um, well, I started my career looking towards becoming an opera singer. Uh, I grew up outside of Philadelphia and was very involved in music as a child. Um, in choirs through school and through church and then getting into uh, musicals throughout uh, high school. And then I decided to pursue uh, higher education in vocal performance. Um, as Taylor mentioned in the little introduction, uh, Taylor and I met the day before our first day at the Eastman School of Music. And uh, you know we've been fast friends and colleagues and now collaborators ever since. Um, so I pursued vocal performance through my undergraduate and then a master's program at the University of Houston. And very, and that was when I was performing with LAMF in the very early um, seasons with the festival. For me, however, as soon as I finished my schooling, uh, I moved to New York to, as I like to say, become an opera singer, <laughs> because uh, that was really what all of my training, I thought was leading towards. And as soon as I arrived in New York and started doing my first rounds of auditions for young artist programs and festivals, um, 
I started questioning whether that was really the path that I as an individual wanted to continue on. Um, you know, when you are so deeply invested in your training, especially in conservatories and universities, in a way you need to put up the blinders and think, okay, I need to focus on being a performer because that is what you're technically being trained to do. But once I had the freedom of sort of choosing my own path, um, I started wondering if there was other parts of the industry that I could be involved in that didn't involve me being on stage. As soon as I started having those thoughts, I thought, boy, I wish I had taken advantage of some things in my undergraduate and master's program that might have helped me in this moment. But, you know, I can share that knowledge with younger singers now. Um, but I decided to make what I call a pivot at that point. I, I knew that I wanted to stay in the industry of classical music and more specifically opera because I still felt that um, I felt drawn to working in the industry. And so I put some feelers out to uh, my network of colleagues of performers turned administrators and started thinking, okay, what slice of the opera world could I potentially become involved in? So my first opportunities were with an artist management company uh, called ADA Artist Management. Uh, and the way that management companies work in the opera industry is that singers, once you reach a certain point in your career, are represented by agents or managers who uh, help sort of craft their career by securing auditions, um, proposing artists for specific projects and then negotiating contracts and sort of being the middle person between the artist and then a producing organization. So I was able to great, get some great experience with ADA artists as an artist manager. At that time, I was working mostly on concert bookings for singers sort of between their larger, you know, six to eight week operatic engagements. Uh, but I very quickly realized that I found myself wanting to be on the other side of the conversations that I was having. Uh, I work with many artist managers in my current position at the Metropolitan Opera on the other side of those conversations. Um, but I, I wanted to be on the sort of producing organization side. So after a few years with ADA, I took a full-time position at Houston Grand Opera. And so I moved back to Houston for the second time uh, to really start my career in American opera houses. At that point, I was given a entry level position in their company office, which uh, a lot of it had to do with building rehearsal schedules and sort of putting together the puzzle of, you know, producing seven operas per season while scheduling the young artists for all of their coachings and rehearsals and sort of being the one-stop shop for guest artists. We would deal with travel, we would deal with housing, press interviews, donor events. And that was an invaluable opportunity to learn what it takes to produce opera from the moment a contract is signed until the moment they're on the plane departing from the engagement. I really got a broad picture understanding of everything that it takes to get an opera on stage. Uh, that job was seasonal also, so I would spend nine months in Houston, and then I was able to go work at the Santa Fe Opera in New Mexico um, over the summer because the schedule sort of locked together perfectly, and I did similar work out in Santa Fe for a summer. Um, if we have any traveling opera lovers, I cannot recommend the Santa Fe Opera enough. It is just such a beautiful place to see opera. Um, in addition to the lakes area, of course, very different, very, <laughs> very different landscapes. But if you need a compliment, uh, I, I certainly recommend it. And then when I returned to Houston after that, uh, there was another job that had opened in the company and uh, I decided to pursue the position of dramaturg for the company. In, in Houston, the, uh, my position as dramaturg involved a lot of work on the creation and development of new works and commissioning new operas. So I got to expand my experience there. I also did a lot of work with community partnerships, sort of finding ways to connect the artwork that we had on stage with the community of Houston. And then 
on the flip side of that, also find inspiration from the community in Houston to then commission works, new operas that we were adding to the canon that really spoke to, you know, more current experiences. Um, you know, in the operatic repertoire, we span, you know, hundreds of years of repertoire, but it, there's a different angle when you're commissioning new works that are based off of certain communities or certain living people's experiences. Um, <clears throat> Houston gave me a lot of opportunities to keep expanding too. So um, in my final year or two with the company, I um, also took on a position of associate artistic director, which was working very closely with the artistic director on long-term planning for the company. So really choosing repertoire, productions, directors, singers for our main stage. Uh, and then I had the opportunity to come to New York also at, at the Met. And it was a difficult decision to leave a company like Houston because they gave me such great experience and I loved the people there. Um, you know, my last season at the, in Houston was, the, was Hurricane Harvey that devastated the Houston community. And we can talk about that separately because we set up shop in a convention center for an entire year after our uh, theater flooded. So I learned some disaster preparation <laughs> in my final year in Houston. But I did um, decide to take a position at the Met in 2018 as the Associate Artistic Administrator. And now my job at the Met focuses uh, a lot on casting of singers, uh, specifically the casting of supporting and featured roles, and then the covers or understudies for all of the productions. The Met does roughly 25 productions per season with over 200 performances. And every single role has a cover, whether it's the title role of Tosca, or the smallest role that just has one line or two, we have a cover for every single role because um, you have to be prepared with an organization of that size when somebody falls sick, somebody has a family emergency. I've dealt with appendicitis. I've dealt with um, people getting stuck on public transportation. You name it, we've seen it, but we have a cover ready to go on at a moment's notice. Um, I also work a lot with the young artists at the Met too. I'm part of the team that scouts and recruits the young artists, the Lindemann Young Artists Program. And I also serve as a judge for the National Council Competition, which is a nationwide annual competition to find those next great operatic stars of the world. Um, so that is sort of a, a broad overview of my trajectory that's led me here. Um, to my current position at the Met. And I was so pleased when Taylor and Scott invited me to be an artistic advisor for the company um, because of my relationship with the company from a decade ago at this point now. Um, mm -hmm. But it also, you know, I, I believe that I can bring a lot of the knowledge that I have built up through these positions and my knowledge of American singers, sort of the market uh, in the work that I do. I hear tons and tons of auditions every year uh, and to be able to bring that work to the festival also. Yeah, going back through all of these uh, various positions and various perspectives on the industry of opera, I wonder if you could point to a few productions as a performer, as an administrator, or both that really solidified your, your love and your drive for this art form? Are there any, any shows that you've been a part of on either side that have really made you think, oh my gosh, this is it, this is what I wanna do? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> you know, when I was still performing and when I was at Eastman, um, I had the opportunity to sing in Benjamin Britten's The Turn of the Screw. And I sang the role of Peter Quint. And this was one of my first like really big, juicy leading roles in my performance career, paired with a really juicy and complex uh, musical score as well. Uh, that experience has kept the turn of the screw as one of, if not my favorite operas, because the, you can 
you can study it and you see the intricacies of the piece. Then you can see a production and you can see a director's interpretation of that piece. And the piece itself has a lot of things that are very unclear. For those of you who aren't familiar with the turn of the screw, it's essentially a ghost story. There are two ghosts haunting a house where there is a governess or sort of a nanny overseeing two young children and they're being haunted by these ghosts. There's a lot of unanswered questions. Are the ghosts real? Are they figments of their imagination? You know, it's, it's open to a lot of different types of interpretation. And that experience sort of stretched my mind open to see the relationship between composer and director and the ability to continue reinterpreting new works within um, the standard repertoire ca canon. Mm -hmm. As an audience member, uh, I always go back to Wagner's Ring Cycle. Uh, when I started in Houston, they were embarking on a four-year telling of the Wagner Ring. The Ring Cycle is four operas. And um, in Houston, they produced one per season over the course of four years, starting with the first year that I was there. So I really got to sink my teeth into it, especially when I moved into the position of dramaturg. I was doing the super titles for the production. So I did, you know, new translations of the three final operas in the cycle, Die Valkyrie, uh, Siegfried, and Goethe Demerung. So I got to dive into what is potentially the, you know, most significant work of art from the 19th century or potentially within the entire operatic canon. It depends on if you're a Wagner fan or not. I know that that can be rather polarizing for some people. Um, but in addition to the score, I also just got to see what it takes for a company to put on Wagner operas mm -hmm. and the, the sheer amount of forces, whether it's in the orchestra or the chorus or the cast, the financial resources needed to produce these big scale works. And again, the way that directors can continue reinterpreting and reimagining pieces that are at this point, 150 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I'm grateful to have now worked on two ring cycles because the Met was doing the ring when I arrived also. Um, and I think I might become one of those ring heads who starts traveling around the country just to see uh, performances of the entire cycle, whether it's professionally or just as a, a lay person. I, you know, it, it bit me and I'm biting back. <laughs> <laughs> Great. You mentioned that a big part of your role at the Metropolitan Opera right now is listening to singers. I know that there have been times when I've come to visit you in New York and you've said, oh my God, I've just listened to however many hundred singers in the past week, yeah. which is both, which sounds both totally overwhelming and incredibly gratifying. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to find out from you maybe starting with the young artists that you uh, that you listen to when you are listening to that volume of singers what are you listening for in a young artist what makes them stand out to you and and stick with you absolutely um first i i, I feel very privileged to get to hear so many auditions um in in normal life, of course. Right now, the volume is a little lower and we're dealing with a lot of digital auditions, but uh, I do consider myself very lucky to get to hear the volume of singers that I do because, you know, coming from a performance background, I know what it's like to walk into an audition room, which is essentially a job interview, but it's almost a one-sided job interview. Rarely is it a conversation uh, it is somebody walking into a room and saying, this is everything I have. Do you like me or not? And that's a challenging headspace to be in. Mm -hmm. um, with young artists in particular, uh, we're looking for a number of things. Uh, when we're recruiting young artists, we are looking for singers that are roughly between the age of 21 and 30 years old. So we're looking for artists that have a number of sort of base level things already established before we would want to bring them into the Young Artist Program. One thing is technique. Uh, 
the, you know, the actual understanding of your body and of what it takes to sing requires a lot of work. And so in, in these auditions for young artists, we're looking for signs of a healthy and sustainable technical framework. So you can often look at somebody's technique by what is not there. Uh, we are looking for legato or beautiful, smooth singing. We are looking for intonation, the ability to sing in tune in all parts of your register. We're looking for free flowing breath or an understanding of how your breath works within your body. Those are sort of the main technical aspects of what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. You're also looking for somebody who is an artist and somebody who has the skill of sharing what they are singing in a way that speaks and resonates with an audience, with, with, with somebody you know, in their soul. Uh, with young artists, we're also looking for nice people and good colleagues. You know, the young artists we typically invest in for two years, they will come into the company for typically two seasons. And so therefore we spend a lot of time with them. And we need to know that they are not only determined and hardworking, but flexible able to receive critiques because unfortunately in this business, there's a lot of critiques, especially for young artists where you are meeting with coaches and voice teachers and administrators, and they'll talk about what you're doing well, but oftentimes we're charged to tell them with what they need to do to push themselves further. Um, so oftentimes when we're looking at young artists, we do interviews, we do practice coachings with them because there's only so much that you can learn um, from just those few minutes of, of singing. But at the risk of sort of defaulting to a cliche, you're looking for that little something special too. Um, that's something that the spark, the drive, the chutzpah, the, I mean, whatever sort of abstract word you want to use, you're looking for something where you say that person might have it, the star mm -hmm. factor. Um, Sometimes we get it right, and sometimes we get it wrong, either in our assessment of the young artists or their participation once they arrive. Mm -hmm. But when you do get to watch these artists grow over the course of two seasons, it is incredibly um, nourishing. Because in these young artists, you're seeing the future performers that we will see on stage and your mind starts dreaming about roles that they could sing on stage or what their career might look like. And so I'm very invested in those younger singers um, because it's easy to find the stars. You know, you can hop on the internet and you can find the 50 best opera singers with the most engagements. That's, that's the easy work, but it's finding the youngsters that you want to help grow that I think is even, is a little harder challenge. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the easy stuff then. So <laughs> when, you, when you're looking at, at casting uh, people who are in the sort of heart of their career for, for main stage roles, is, it, is there a difference in what you're looking for in these later stage singers? There is, yeah. Um, you know, I should mention back with the young artists too, age does really matter at that point. Because if we hear a, a 22 year old with that star potential that the fairy dust that you can't really describe whose languages are really great, but the technique isn't quite there. We have time to match them with the right teacher and fill in the gaps. You could have the opposite. You could find somebody with great technique and they have the spark, but they've never had access to high level language training. So we can fill in those gaps. Mm -hmm. You know, when I'm looking for people to sing on the main stage, you need to have it all already, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and in the same breath, that does depend on the production. There are certain times where I need somebody to just walk out on stage, stand like a soldier and deliver, you know, 32 bars of something very non-emotional. Mm -hmm. So there is some flexibility in what I'm looking for there. but we're really looking for a fully formed artist. So I'm looking for the same things, technique, interpretation, and then 
this sort of ability to draw in an audience with their um, with their passions. With the Met in particular, I also am casting for a very specific hall. You know, the Metropolitan Opera seats 3,800 people. It is huge. It is, my dog is saying hello also. Emma. Hi, Emma. <laughs> um, Emma does like opera too. She has been to some outdoor operas, not indoor ones, but um, uh, the, the space of the Met is a blessing and a curse. You know, it, it is a blessing in that we can fit 3,800 people in the same space to experience an opera in real time together. That is a big community coming together for those, you know, three or four hours. It is also a curse because pretty much everybody recognizes that the Met is too big. The, the physical theater is, is, too, is often too big for what we're trying to accomplish. Um, Voices need a certain presence to fill a hall of that size and to soar over an orchestra of the size that we have at the Met too. An additional challenge is at the Met, because we do 25 operas roughly per season, we span almost every time period of operas. You know, the bulk of our works come from the 18th and the 19th century. You know, our Mozarts, our bel cantos, our um, Strausses, Wagners, Verdi's, that's really the bread and butter. But we also do Baroque works. We do Handel operas almost pretty much once per season. These operas were not written for 3,800 seat theaters. I mean, they're, they're written for a fraction of that size. And yet we given the volume of works that we do, we program Baroque operas. We also program contemporary operas, things from the 20th and now 21st century and new works as well. So you are looking for a specific, I don't want to use the word size of instrument, but an instrument that has the ability to cut and carry. That's not just about volume at the Met. And I think that has been sort of a misconception prior to sort of a new generation of administrators joining the company. There are opera singers who were incredibly successful at the Met who did not have large voices. Um, you know, Kathy Battle is a great example. That voice was not big, but it had a color and a point and a focus to it that could be heard in the very back of the hall in all of the repertoire that she sang. Mm -hmm. So. I'm looking for a number of different things. Um, you know, I'm also have been charged with and very passionate about bringing new voices to the Met too. Um, you know, given the volume of works that we do, we have to turn to the people that we know and love out of a necessity. But we also need to be giving those opportunities to people to see what they see how they do on the main stage in a full production. Um, if we don't try people out in those opportunities, we're going to run out of singers. So I'm very passionate in sort of creating a larger roster every season of singers so that we can get to know more artists, continue building those relationships, and then see if we can sort of dream for bigger and larger projects for all of them. Yeah. Well, and that brings me to this coming weekend, a big part of, of what you did for us in curating Transcending the Night mm -hmm. was the selection of the two singers. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me what, what attracted you to Brandy and Justin and yeah, how do they fit into all of this? Absolutely. Um, Brandy and Justin, I did not know until I came to the Met in 2018. So they are newer professional colleagues of mine. And Brandy, I had the opportunity to meet first. Um, right when I arrived at the Met in 2018, we were preparing for um, the premiere of a new production of Porgy and Bess the following year. And uh, my colleagues at the Met had said, there is a, a young black soprano that we're interested in have, having cover and potentially sing some performances of Clara in Porgy and Bess. Mm -hmm. And that first fall that I was there, she was doing performances of Pamina in the Magic Flute at Kentucky Opera. So one of the first work trips that I take, which 
in a non in, in a normal time i'm traveling quite a lot to see operas and to scout and recruit singers uh, and so i went to kentucky to see her sing in a larger hall because that was one of the important parts to see what would the voice sound like over an orchestra outside mm -hmm. of an audition room in a larger hall uh, and she gave a fantastic performance of Pamina. And I said, yes, this is somebody who could sing performances of Clara in, in Porgy and Bess. Clara sings the iconic Summertime right at the beginning of the opera. Uh, and so we did engage Brandy um, to cover and then sing a few performances of Clara. And actually, uh, when we went to record this recital, uh, it was, the, it was originally supposed to be in the very first days of February here in New York. And then we needed to cancel it because of um, uh, the first big major snowstorm that hit the that hit New York at the beginning of February. So we postponed it by thankfully only three or four days. We were able to shift very quickly. And would you know that new recording date ended up being the one year anniversary of Brandy's debut at the Met as Clara in Porgy and Bess. Oh, that's so great. There was something in there that said, okay, this is meant to happen, uh, you know, a, a few days later. But because of the success of Brandy in that performance, we then engaged her to sing Frasquita in Carmen in the um, 1920 season. Unfortunately, those performances were canceled. Um, I'm sorry, the 2021 season that would have been. Uh, and then we knew that we wanted to keep looking for opportunities for her. So in the 21-22 season, she will sing um, a performance of the fairy godmother in Massenet's setting of Cinderella uh, this December. So we're, you know, we found the introduction, we were looking for roles to expand, and now she'll get to sing the fairy godmother this December. Justin um, was originally supposed to make his debut in the 2021 season also with um, the motorcycle cop in Dead Man Walking and then the novice's friend in Billy Bud. Unfortunately, those were canceled as well, uh, but we did find a new debut for him in the 21-22 season in a new setting of Hamlet by Brett Dean, uh, a fantastic Australian composer. Uh, he'll sing the role of Marcellus in that next season. So I was very happy to provide to the festival two artists that I knew and have worked with um, in my work at the Met, and then introducing them to LAMF as a festival, but also to your audiences as well. Mm -hmm. I want to take it back to uh, when you were talking about that realization that you had around Turn of the Screw of the interaction between a musical material, a subject matter, a director's interpretation, the performers, and all of those things sort of coming together to turn on the light bulb of a love of opera. Mm -hmm. When you are watching productions now, much as how I asked you, what do you look for in singers? And this obviously is, is not your professional role, but what as an audience member do you look for in an opera production? Mm. I think it oftentimes it depends on my mood, I'll be honest, um, mm -hmm. and the repertoire that's being presented. Um, there are some times where I want to go to the opera and see what I like to call sort of a capital O opera production of something big and grand and traditional that really hits the marks of what you might sort of immediately jump to when you're thinking of big grand opera. I mean, mm -hmm. at the Met, that tends to be like the big Zeffirelli productions, which are just big, classic, standard, and really um, as grand as you can get. You know, for me right now, especially being uh, sort of separated from opera for so long, I want to go into a big room with hundreds and thousands of people <laughs> and sort of have the blow your hair back type of turn dot moment. Yeah. Um, but oftentimes outside of my current <laughs> mindset, I'm looking for some sort of new interpretation of an opera that will tell me something that I haven't thought about before, either in the storytelling, in the setting of the piece, in the interaction between the characters. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean <laughs> 
taking La Boheme and setting it on Mars, you know, which is a production that exists in Paris. Yes. <laughs> or maybe they're on the moon. I can't remember, but it is sort of like <laughs> an intergalactic uh, La Boheme. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, it doesn't, and I'm just sharing my own opinions on this. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily need to go quite to that extreme in order to tell me something new about, about the repertoire. But, you know, I, I see a lot of Bohems, Carmens, Aidas, Figaro's, sort of the ABCs of opera. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I'm drawn to something that places it in a slightly different setting that might make me think about the piece in a different way. And yeah. then in the same breath, I have sat down for a very traditional Cosi Fan Tutte, where I sort of found myself thinking, okay, this is a period production of Cosi, get comfortable. And then I'm and then I'm blown away because there are other times when the singing and the acting is so impeccable that it could be a concert production, it could be a period production, it it doesn't matter. The performances yeah. are so pure and connected that you're reminded why it is such a successful piece. Yeah. So I think that's where variety comes into play. Um, not just at the Met, but in other companies, um, you get to sort of stretch yourself and surprise yourself by maybe going to a pr production that you think, oh, I'm not going to like that. I always say, just try it because it, it will speak to you in some way and it allows you to then hone your taste and your preferences and maybe in a more specific way. Yeah. And I think that's great for our audience to hear that even professionals when they enter the hall and know that they are about to get into a four hour opera experience often have that moment when they sit down that says, oh no, I'm here for four hours. But then I, my last, uh, the last thing that I saw at the Met reminded me of that. I think it was Massonet's Manon. Ah, and I realized that this is a big extended piece of very traditional production. And I had that exact thought as I sat down, I thought, oh, this is long. And then the moment it started, the singing and the acting was so beautiful that it didn't need any embellishments to be really, really touching and really effective. Right, but it, you know, it does, it, it takes the commitment <clears throat> to see an yeah. opera. Yeah. But I think that's what's so special about it too, is that every opera that you see is an event in itself. Mm -hmm. You know, you are getting out of your house, you're going into a theater, you are committing to a length of time. So you need to think about like, you know, am I eating a big enough meal beforehand, planning your bathroom breaks to make it through and you're committing to sort of turning yourself over to this experience. Yeah. And one step further than that with live performances, you are part of a community that is seeing that performance and then it will never exist again you know, outside of broadcasts and recordings and things, which of course we have a lot of these days, but you know, the bulk of performances are not recorded and archived and then performed again. So because of that, you as an audience member have a unique experience that if you were not there, you did not get to experience it. And if you were to come back for the next performance, it will not be exactly the same. And I think that's what keeps drawing me back especially those weeks where I'm seeing five or six operas a week, <laughs> mm -hmm. that it's going to be different every single time. And that is yeah. I, one of the other things that really keeps drawing me back to it. And another thing that I sort of hear in your description of that is that there are so many ways to make this art form relevant to our lives today. Mm -hmm. that whether it is a new take on an old work or whether it is just the incredible vibrancy of an amazing performance, the thing that makes it connect with audiences is that some aspect of the production or the performance is reaching across all of those years of, let's say, an old work and making that piece of art feel immediate and personal and relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And for those who are less familiar with opera, that can be a challenging point to get 
beyond. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it can be a barrier to access until you actually go and experience it because you know, if you read a synopsis of an opera, sometimes you think, oh, like, how is this going to be relevant to me at all? You know, yeah. if I go back to Cosi Fan Tutte, like, okay, these, you know, these people who are swapping lovers to try and test each other and they're putting on disguises and tricking each other. It's like, wow, that just feels silly and unrelatable. Mm -hmm. But then when you go to a performance of Cosi, you see that it's about individuals dealing with crisis of relationships. And so once you get beyond the sort of silly plot synopsis, you're seeing that people are dealing with the concept of fidelity. What does that mean in friendships, in romantic relationships? You're seeing, um, you know, themes of like sisters and relationships. How do you deal with family members? and um, you do have to sort of turn yourself over to opera and allow it to be relevant to you. And um, once you do, you see that a lot of the emotional themes that are explored are much more universal than they might appear on page. But that often has to do less with the singers and more with the orchestra too, mm. because a really fascinating uh, aspect of opera is the subtext of the orchestra. The singer is singing text. And so we know what they're saying via the, um, the titles that are projected above. But oftentimes within the orchestra, you hear their mind thinking. In Mozart, he often puts little sort of flutters of heartbeats. If, if they're talking about fidelity or a, a partner, you can almost hear a contrasting something happening in the orchestra. Wagner uses this like crazy with his leitmotifs where somebody can be telling a story to their father and then the orchestra is telling all this completely other story about the siblings and the boyfriend and the curse and everything but the art the 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 soprano is saying something else mm -hmm. so um just like in our normal lives where we might be speaking with family or dealing with a conflict where you're saying something but you feel something different in your body I often think of like the orchestra as being the body and the soul of what the singer might be saying. Yeah. So continuing on sort of with your, again, personal observations, your personal tastes and, and the things that you've seen, um, you mentioned being a part of a new generation of opera administrators. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what the trends are that you see happening in the opera world in, in all sort of aspects of, of the art form. What are some, what are the innovations that are happening? What is, what's very current? Where do you see this going? Sure. Um, I guess it should be sort of broken up into a few categories. Um, one side would be the commissioning of new works. And another would be how do we cast and produce works from the you know, 18th and 19th centuries. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to new works and commissioning new works, there is a, first of all, the idea of commissioning new operas is still rather new. You know, it, it really, is for American operas as well. Yes, there are American operas from the first half of the 20th century, but it really wasn't until a post Benjamin Britten era, sort of the 1950s and later where we're seeing American operas being commissioned to add to the canon. I think that there was a long feeling of that this is a European art form that we are presenting in the United States, but it's not mm -hmm. our art form. So that has shifted. Therefore, we then saw a huge surge of composers in the latter half of the 20th century, the Carlisle Floyds, the Mark Adamos, the John Corleanos, who are adding pieces to the repertoire. Mm -hmm. They were often grand and big and looking at stories in the past still. Now that we're looking at opera in the 21st century and to think we're already 20 years into the 21st century, we're seeing a, a shift in telling stories that haven't been told on the operatic stage before. 
often with uh, marginalized communities, uh, with living people, uh, and operas about specific communities. There's then a, 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 a larger discussion about who gets to tell those stories. You know, if we are talking about the, um, you know, the Latino experience in the United States, should that be written by a Latinx composer? There's no right answer, but there are these questions about who should be telling what types of stories and how specific those stories should be. Um, <clears throat> on the sort of performing and producing side, there are lots of necessary and overdue discussions about how to approach some of the pieces in the uh, standard repertoire that are a little problematic from with the perspective of 21st century eyes. Um, you know, there are certain pieces in the repertoire that are a little outdated in how they portray specific communities, specifically communities of color. Um, if we look at Madame Butterfly, which you know is on paper supposed to star a 15-year-old Japanese geisha, but it has often been sung by white sopranos in their 40s and 50s. How can you continue to tell that story, but in a way that Identif that, that addresses that and identifies that and then uses the production as a way to be in dialogue with the art form. Mm -hmm. Some, some uh, producing organizations are looking to cast a very Japanese cast for the, the Japanese characters and then an American cast for, or a white cast for Pinkerton and some of the, you know, the American roles in that opera. That's just one specific example. Um, but there's no one right way to do it either, because then in the same breath, you can say, well, what if there is a fantastic black soprano that can sing the spots off of Cho-Cho-san in Madame Butterfly? Does that mean that we should not cast them? Mm -hmm. There's no right answer to it, but it does allow us to use the art form as a way to have challenging, necessary conversations about how we produce opera in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. I would just add to that, uh, of course, a lot of the standard repertoire is problematic in terms of race and eth ethnicity, but also in terms of uh, gender, there is so much misogyny in, in these plots and in these texts. But in a way, I would say that we are fortunate in that we are forced to engage and examine these old problematic works mm -hmm. and to sort of excavate them to find what and how they can be produced in a way that honors and and uh, doesn't just sort of sweep under the rug those problems so i think in some ways that can even be considered a, a strength is that if it's done right, having to confront these things is, is really important. Absolutely. And I, I think that we are sort of then stewards of those conversations too. And we must take the responsibility to frame those works um, mm -hmm. in a way that does move it forward, not just keep opera as something in a museum. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that's, that's a bit about an approach to production. When you think of individual artists, how is the artist, the, let's say the 30 year old opera singer of today, how are their priorities, their skill sets, their everything maybe different than an opera singer in 1990? Sure. Um... You know, the sort of world of an opera singer outside of their performances in let's say the 90s or, you know, um, was more opera singer as star mm -hmm. and then sort of opera singer as diva. You know, the public wanted these larger than life figures 
you think of like the Maria Callas's and the people who just like oozed luxury and, um, you know, uh, opulence, because that was sort of what the expectation was. Now, singers are required to be much more than just performers. You know, especially if we look at the rise of social media and the platform that individuals have, we now see artists as activists too. Okay. Not to say that that didn't exist in the 20th century, but we're seeing so much more of it now. Mm -hmm. um, artists who can use their platform uh, of success in a way to engage with um, both audiences, but communities in a way that they haven't before. We see many more singers getting out of the rehearsal room and into the classroom, mm -hmm. uh, speaking with young singers about what a career in the arts could look like, not to recruit people, but maybe to encourage them to turn to the arts as a way to process their everyday life. Um, we see, especially over the last 12 months now, people using digital platforms to create their own types of projects and sort of serve as producers to program works in a way that they're in a dialogue with current events as well, to provide like an opportunity for healing or hope through, through the arts. Yeah. Um, I think that the days of the, uh, the opera singer as just a performer are, are gone pretty much mm -hmm. because um, we're seeing it expand, we're seeing people react positively to it and so I hope that's a trend that will stick around and keep going for, for many more years. Yeah. One thing that's a, possibly just a stereotype, and correct me if, if you don't agree, mm -hmm. would you say that the, um, the, what's the word I'm looking for? The emphasis on dramatic training and expectations is greater on opera singers today than it was in, in the 20th century? Absolutely. Um, you know, in the 20th century, again, to sort of default to stereotypes, there was the idea of park and bark, <laughs> which is you park out in one spot on the stage and you bark out your aria and then you leave. <clears throat> and that was sort of, in many productions, the standard way to do it. Just hit your mark, sing beautifully, and then walk off stage. Dramatically, directors are asking for much more, audiences are expecting much more, and the digital landscape has shifted that as well. The rise of HD digital broadcasts has meant that now you get to see a camera as close as we are right now, mm -hmm. seeing every facial feature and every detail uh, in a way that, again, many of these operas were not written for. Yeah. The operas of the 19th century were not made to be viewed this closely. And yet, now with the rise of technology, which I think is a great impact on, on, on the art form, we have the ability to be, for the proximity to be so much closer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I could go off on a whole other tangent on how much is too much dramatically in an, <laughs> in an audition because I have seen people do magic tricks in auditions. I've seen people do splits. I've seen people crawl under the table. Like I, every time I think I, I've seen it all, somebody else whips out some other, <clears throat> I don't want to say trick or shtick, but you know, there's, the, you can show that you have a dramatic connection without, <laughs> you know, doing so, all of those things in, in one 10 minute audition. <laughs> yeah, we have some great questions here. I would encourage everybody who's listening to uh, type in their questions now. And I wanted to start with one from Dave Foran who asks, Paul, do you have any opportunities to perform anymore? Ah, um, you know, It was sort of a conscious choice for me to really step away from that. Um, and so opportunities might not be the right word for me because if I wanted to, I could find a way to perform, you know? And up until even just a couple years ago, I was, you know, doing some fill-in work with 
um, church choirs as a way to sort of just scratch that itch a little bit. Um, but I really personally don't miss it anymore. Mm. Um, I, I take such ownership in the work that I do. And when I see performances on stage that I had something to do with, I get that similar level of satisfaction and um, ownership in the work that's on stage. Hmm. Um, you know, technically, if you don't use it, you lose it as a singer too. <laughs> so if I wanted to try and sing through arias right now, honestly, I, I probably couldn't. <laughs> uh, or they would not be fit for public consumption. Let me put it that way. Um, but, you know, I do have a, a keyboard here in my small apartment in New York, and I, I enjoy working through scores, either for new works that I'm working on or works that I'm studying. Um, or even if it's just, you know, fooling around on the piano and singing a little bit that sort of fills my heart in a way that um, allows me to perform more for myself instead of performing for somebody else. Mm -hmm. and, and I sort of hear in that something that I really love, which is that in a way, the, the nourishment that you got from performing has been transferred to these other artists whose performances you are facilitating in mm -hmm. a way. Is that, did I miss the mark? No, absolutely. Um, again, for me, it comes into like that ownership and to know that I'm part of supporting that artist or those artists on stage, not just in giving them the opportunity to, you know, sing at the Met, but you know, we do, we visit them backstage beforehand and you, you need to emotionally support them in a way so that they are set up for success. Mm -hmm. And that takes a similar type of energy as performing. You're just not the one on stage. Yeah. Yeah. And we have a question here from Charlotte who asks, how much do you rely on, excuse me, on subtitles depending on core, of course, on the language in which that production is sung? Any tips for opera goers who don't know the language the opera will be in? Mm. I love super titles or subtitles. You know, there's different ways to, re to, to uh, refer to them. But I look at it as a way, it, it's another way to increase access and remove a barrier. And I say that even for operas that are performed in English. Um, most, but not all companies, when you're doing an opera in English, will also still put the titles above because, you know, it, it is tough to deliver text in a way that is understandable in every range, every part of the range, especially the extremes, the very top and the very bottom. Oftentimes singers need to modify the vowels or consonants that they're singing to just be able to sing those notes. Um, so I, I rely very heavily on them and I enjoy them because it also is then another artist's interpretation of the work that's on the page, especially when we get to translations. Um, and, you know, in translating The Ring in Houston or Mozart operas or Rosalka, Slavic repertoire, um, you get to see artistry. And so for me, it's another way to engage with a creative personality. For those who might worry about not knowing the language, um, do a little research before. You know, if, if you see that the production will have super titles, that is very good to know. If they don't, you'll need to do a, a little more research to really be able to soak in the opera to its fullest extent. Um, in terms of how much to read up about the plot, I think that's a personal choice. You know, some people want to study an opera in a significant way so that they're not worried about missing a plot point. But as a result, you might spoil the ending. You know, is she gonna jump off the building at the end or not? <laughs> <laughs> um, but for other people, they want to have that sort of fresher experience of experiencing it in real time. Um, so there's no one way to do it. But I think you need to settle into your own style of how to prepare yourself for an opera. Some operas just take some more preparation also. You know, the frothy mm -hmm. bel canto operas of 
the elixir of love, you don't need to do a lot of studying up. But even in something like that, the bel canto operas, there's a lot of repeated text throughout the course of individual arias or individual scenes. So oftentimes when text is repeated, the super title slide will go to blank because they're not just gonna keep repeating the same two sentences over and over again. But for some audience members, they think that something went wrong because they say, why are the titles? I have no idea what they're saying there. So it does take a certain level of you know, understanding um, to really understand how and how the titles function. I will say that I think the hardest super titles that I've ever had to work on were Sondheim works. Hmm. Partially because they're very wordy and so it's tough to cram everything into the little box that you have access to. Um, but more importantly, his jokes land at the very end of almost every line. The, the text is so smart and so witty, but it often lands at the very last few words of the phrase. And so timing becomes key. You know, you, I will often split sentences up because you don't want somebody to read a joke before it happens. And when it's in English, the audience knows a little more about whether the joke is, you know, it's different in Mozart where you can leave some words out or kind of get a little more creative with the translation. But those Sondheim pieces are very tough to do super titles for. Yeah. And I would just say, I mean, I know Charlotte and I know that she is very good at doing her research and homework for, for productions and operas. But <clears throat> one of the joys of, for me as a singer is that it's it's almost limitless the amount of preparation that you can do because in the end, you're you're not only dealing with uh, you know this production, you're dealing with poetry, you're dealing with historical context, you're dealing with all of these things that I really love to geek out on, and I, I bet many of our audience members do as well. And so there's really no limit to how deep you can go into these works and still find something new and surprising. Exactly. I will do a plug for one book in particular, just because I've talked about Wagner a lot. And I know Flying Dutchman was on the docket for yeah. uh, for last season, um, especially since Wagner in particular feels the most inaccessible to a lot of people. If you're looking for an introduction to Wagner, I highly recommend a book called Wagner Without Fear by William Berger. It's written in a very accessible way. They even talk about like when to take a bathroom break if you really need to. If you <laughs> line out like in Goethe Demerung, you can skip these 20 minutes if you really need to go to the bathroom because it's just a repeat of everything that you've already heard. So um, I think it's also important to find the sources that speak to you in a way that works for you because you can go as high, you know, academic as you, as possible but sometimes you just want somebody to speak to you like a real person and say, look, this is what it's about. These are the main characters. These are the important parts. Go off and enjoy. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's about all the time we have. Thank you so much, Paul, for, for joining us and for curating this concert. A real quick plug, the, the concert that Paul has curated for us at the Lakes Area Music Festival is called Transcending the 